Um, order of importance for the different age groups, and then we have three different senior players. Um, so our U10 group, um, this was how they ranked in, in terms of order of importance. Has anybody got, sorry, I've put speed endurance there twice. Uh, that's not bad. I don't know which one's missing. Power, maybe. Power. Um, anybody, any, any thoughts or comments on that for your U10s? So, uh, whoever did this uh, um, order here, they had balance was the most important, and then power, I think that would be, has been the least important. Anybody, any thoughts, comments? Anybody? Yep. I think you need power at this age group. I mean, the more the attacking mode and the, the first to the ball. So power is strength at speed. So power, for me, would be down here, because that's probably the least thing that you focus on. At these ages, U10s, they're still kind of growing and continue to grow. They, at that age, do not have developed endurance systems. So the ABCs are pretty much the most important um, for that age group. And then in terms of speed, you, you would more look at the runner mechanics for players. Okay, so again, young players, you want to get good runner mechanics in there, so that when they grow and grow, uh, grow th go through puberty, get an increase in muscle mass, now you add on the intensity of the speed, but with good runner mechanics. You look at some players at the elite level, and because they didn't do some of this work early on, they're fast, but some of their running mechanics are horrible. Again, if you can put in good running style at the younger ages, efficient running mechanics, then again, as they get older, you're going to then improve speed more efficiently. Okay? So for me, the person who did this, this was good. The only thing you might do is just bump up strength a little bit. Because what is strength? How can you do a strength exercise? Give me an example of a strength exercise, anybody. Squat. Bodyweight squat. So using your body weight alone is a strength exercise. Single leg, you know, we did some stuff out on the field yesterday. Um, we didn't do push-ups, we did sit-ups, so core strength. So again, even just using your body weight is a strength exercise. And children, probably more in England, who play around in the playground, out on the field, they're kind of doing more than that anyway. So for me, again, at these younger ages, you can work on, um, probably throw strength up there a little bit and bump endurance down, because strength, just body weight, is good to program and just get good, efficient movement patterns for say a squat so that when they go through the puberty again, you've got good mechanics, good movement, and then you add on the muscle mass, and now you develop strength even more. Our U12s, so for me, these pair are, are kind of similar because they're still at that age. What, uh, what age do girls usually go through puberty? 12 to 14. Boys is 14 to 16, so girls tends to be 12 to 14. So again, up to, Obviously, we're going to have some early developers, so some might start 11, 12. Um, obviously, once you then go through puberty, get an increase in muscle mass, girls also get increased adipose tissue, so fatty, fatty tissue stores. So again, addressing kind of diet, nutritional needs is important as well as you go through puberty. But again, similar, um, strength is up there, which I like to see. So ABC strength, speed runner mechanics, and again, these things are kind of further down. The only thing you might think about is flexibility being kind of up there as well. Because again, you want good range of motion about the joints, good suppleness in your players, um, and basically just good all around flexibility. But again, think about that simple one we did yesterday, and we hit agility, strength, coordination, balance, speed, flexibility. So we actually hit six of those parameters in that, in that session yesterday. So again, it's how many things can you get out of the sessions that you're doing. And just a simple tweak on a session, um, can you check off one of these boxes and you just get more repetition each week, a bit like touches on the ball. If you do some kind of passing drill that gets 50, 100, 100 passes in one session a week and you do that for, whatever, 20 weeks of the year, suddenly a player now has had a thousand touches more than if you do an exercise without a ball. So again, th think about that all the time. How can you tweak something that you already do or introduce something so you get more than one outcome. So our 14s now are starting to go through that puberty. Okay, so as they go through puberty, they get an increase in muscle mass. Are your players getting stronger? Yeah. We're getting some whispers, some nods, some shake of heads. 
Anybody, what to say? Like it, she read my notes. Um, <laughs> you get an increase in muscle mass, but you're not necessarily getting stronger if you don't use it. Okay, so yeah, your your kind of muscles might grow, and um, but again, if you're not doing movements to to necessarily develop it, you're not necessarily going to get stronger. So again, for me, some of this assumes they've done this and this. Okay, but for me here, you've gone through puberty, and um, and also um, they talk about a term called peak height velocity. Have you heard of that? What is that? You're all nodding vigorously, I like it. Uh, what is peak height velocity? Anybody? Oh, oh did you just do it this morning? Oh, okay. Check. Say again. PHV, so peak height velocity. So it's basically your fastest rate of growth. So when you go through puberty, you start increasing muscle mass, and you get a growth spurt, if you like, and it's that peak of that growth spurt. And again, what some of the research shows is that if you develop endurance at that stage, you get the fastest rate of development. Okay? So it's not to say you can't develop um, endurance at any other time, but if you try and hit that fastest rate of growth in puberty, you can accelerate almost the, the improvement, because suddenly the, the, the players, the girls, are getting um, the... Uh, or in increase like energy capacity in the body and all the hormones and everything that helps that with that improvement in endurance. Okay, and um, so for this one, I probably go, I probably bump speed down. Um, for me, strength would be top. I'd almost have strength and endurance. Um, I'd still be having your A, Bs, and Cs. Um, and once your players have then gone through that puberty, for me, you've then helped develop the um, strength and the endurance. Once they've done that, I'd then add on a second speed window and use the strength you've now gained and really work on speed. So for me, I'd almost go strength one, endurance two. Um, you could keep those in there. I'd bump speed down to five or six. And I would still keep power and speed endurance towards the bottom. Because for me, they would be the next in the window, the U16s. Make sense? So our U16s, which I think was a goalkeeper, I think I read that right. Was it 16 and a goalkeeper, or 18? Just thought about the fact that you, the needs are different for a goalkeeper from, from a forward. So yeah. Specify who talks about. So now we're getting uh, sassy or sexy, if you like, because now he's talking about positions, which is a great point. For me, probably up until now, you're not necessarily going positional. And um, again, I don't know kind of coaching philosophies. It might be play players in different uh, positions. But once you get 16 and upwards, and certainly at the kind of national team level, your players are either technically in a certain position um, or they're physically of the attributes of a certain position, so you almost feel like get pigeonholed in a way. Um, so obviously for goalkeepers, U16 level, for me, I'd still be saying kind of strength and power would be important elements for your goalkeepers. I'd be putting, yeah, like, like Ian um, and his group had, endurance and speed endurance at the bottom. Um, but for me, like their strength and power would be the big ones. And I'd, I'd probably have strength still as number one. Yeah, they've gone through this puberty, um, but for me, you can still keep making strength gains, um, and then maybe have power second, work on these elements in here, certainly endurance, speed endurance at the bottom. Speed, I'd probably shift up, because what do we mean by speed? Remember from yesterday, what do we mean by speed? Accelerate, decelerate, what else? Change of direction of kind of more agility, reaction speed, important for goalkeepers. Um, and also short speed, so your five, ten yard stuff. So I almost bump this higher up here. Um, like I say, our our senior players are now on their off-season programs. Um, the goalkeepers uh, have three strength power sessions a week, and then their um, conditioning sessions are more kind of short intervals. Uh, not always running because I don't think they necessarily need to do the running and sometimes having the non-impact work is good because when they go into the goalkeeper technical sessions they're hitting the floor a lot so it just takes some of the pounding away but two of our players were in uh, town today so this morning Alyssa Nair current number one uh, we just did some uh, we got a thing called a Nord board so we can measure their hamstring strength 
and actually both the players in this morning um, got hamstring strength scores comparable to the average score of, of male players in the, in the Premiership in the UK. Um, so for me, like strength and power is such an important component for especially elite, elite athletes, but especially females. You cannot ignore strength, especially for that injury prevention piece. We then look at our three senior players, who didn't do the homework. Um, Alex Morgan, Carly Lloyd, and Mallory Pugh. Um, again, this is where you go very individual and specific. Um, like Alex is 28, Mal is 19, Carly's 35. So you look at position, you look at injury history, you look at individual needs. Like you're not gonna look at Carly and go, we're gonna make you faster. You're gonna look at Carly and go, what do we need to make you better for you, your position, what's coming up? Similar with Alex, obviously being a forward, a lot of her game is about speed power. So for me, for her, having these in there and having her healthy are the main things. And at times, if she needs to do um, endurance work that is not impact to preserve her knees or ankles, then we do that. So again, for me, this isn't a one model fits all. It is a very individual and specific to that individual player. Okay? Any questions on any of that? So pretty much we start here, A, B, C's. As they go through puberty, you start shifting those down and work on your strength. Get through here, you now start adding on intensity. Strength, endurance, speed, get here, and it's all about individual needs of the players. Okay? Any questions? Okay, moving on. So I then throw that back to you. Of those nine fitness elements, do you cover all of those fitness components in your sessions every single week? And you might... Ask the person next to you, what age group do you work with? Do you all work at the same level? So you all need them at different rates or different levels and different amounts, different weeks of the year. Like if you're in season and you're playing three games over a weekend, uh, which I know sometimes um, youth teams do, then obviously your week leading up to that is going to be very different than if you have no games on the weekend. So then it's about periodization and all that other sassy uh, kind of uh, context in, in terms of what you do. This is just a model, and you may have seen this this morning, about the long-term kind of play development. So this is kind of development age. Um, so this is that peak height velocity. And again, this is the rate of growth. So obviously, when you're an infant from zero to two, you grow rapidly. And then the rate you grow drops off. Otherwise, we'd all be like 10-foot <laughs> giants. Um, rate drops off until you hit puberty. Then you get that second growth window. So again, this is the, the ABCs here, and flexibility, focus on initially, get that peak height velocity, now add in speed two, which is the intensity window, endurance, and then um, add in on strength, now that you've got increased muscle mass, okay? Ultimately, what are we trying to achieve? Me, at my level, I wanna, I wanna optimize physical performance. So I wanna get players as fit physically as I can. At the same time, want to minimize injury rates, okay? Because ultimately, we're preparing players for games. So everything I do is all about, can I get the players fitter, physically ready, fit in with uh, Jill's playing style, which she basically wants to run like hell with players, so I'm like, okay, that challenges me a bit. Um, but at the same time, you need to plan your preparation, your season, our weeks leading into games, so that we don't have ridiculously high injury rates. Okay, so that's everything we do. If we talk about injury rates, anybody guess who that is? No. No. Mary Pugh, probably about 10 years ago. Um, injury rates in youth soccer have continued to increase. Females are eight to 10 times more likely than males to do an ACL injury. And a lot of that we can help with. Education, injury prevention, some of those simple exercises I did yesterday, knee stability. We had one senior player who, um, it might not be rocket science to work out, but did her an ACL injury about 12 months ago. She came into camp, and in camp we just do some simple, simple uh, kind of injury prevention knee stability exercises where I just literally get the players to hop, land. And the main thing about landing is to stick your ass out, bend your knee slightly, kind of centered around the knee. Knee, certainly not. She would do this exercise and basically is landing with her knee fully extended. And I'm like, Shoot, she's just come back from an ACL injury and that's another way to happen. So there's simple things like that 
You just give your players, you know, um, stick your ass out on land and bend your knees slightly, good mechanics the whole time, and it's just cues like that that can really help to reduce those injury rates. In the World Cup finals in 2015, we were together, like I said, I think 65 days. In that whole period, we had one player, ironically this player, who missed two training sessions and wasn't available for one game. Other than that, the other 22 players in the squad were available for every training session and every game. And some of that was the work we did in the January where we lifted heavy, did a lot of power work, did a lot of endurance work, and basically the players became so resilient, resilient as well as so good as look, at looking after themselves off the field, after games, after training, that they were recovered, they were healthy, they were strong, they were resilient. So again, for me, as much as you're talking about what you do on the field, what does your player do as soon as they get in the car with mom or dad and kind of go home? Are they going straight through in and out or fat burger or whatever it is and straight away you've lost that window. So as much as what they do on this field, what are they doing off it? This is some of, um, I'm still on some of our, uh, we've got an equivalent person to me who works with our youth teams. I'm still on some of our work here, so I'll give her a shout out, Ellie Mabry. Um, we basically track readiness of players where 100 is 100% ready. So players log in online, as much as our seniors do it, our 20s all the way down do it as well. Um, they then put in how fresh they feel, how well they slept, what is their mood today, how sore are they. They then get a score out of 100, so 100 is the maximum you can get. So basically, this is every day of this player filling it in. Uh, she plays a game here, I think plays a game here, drops, recovers, plays another game, drops, recovers, doesn't recover, now gets injured. Okay, so again, simple. You might not have something as fancy, fancy as this, but you have the ability to ask a player, hey, Jane, how are you feeling today? I know the, um, or I know of the, the um, fitness person who works at PSG in France with the men, and uh, his way of having a wellness with Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who like, who's going to tell him to put <laughs> these things in, was like, hey, how are you doing today? And if he just like looked at him and walked off, he knew there was something he'd not slept well or something like that. So even like they, the guys said it there about having that communication with your players is so crucial to have a handle on how they're feeling. And then if a player comes and you can see they look tired or they start the warm up and they don't look good, then for me you drop off, otherwise they are going to get injured. This is, uh, again, this is Ellie's fancy, fancy work rather than mine, but again, and you know, I can send some of these things to, uh, to the guys here to pass on so you don't have to write it all down. But what are you doing recovery-wise after a game? Again, do you have access to all of these? If not, can you improvise? Like we use protein, um, protein products, but chocolate milk, which by the way Kelly O'Hara endorses, is just as effective as, uh, as any kind of protein powder you can spend $40 and buy. So again, don't just say there isn't a way to do it, we don't have the resources, find a way. That's one of my things, I might not be the smart, smartest cookie in the jar, but I'll always find a way to, to get around it or find something else to do. If, the Federation or somebody says, no, I'll find another way to do it or another avenue. So again, don't just stop there. It's about the jobs are out there, like apply for it. Don't just take no as the answer, find another way to get to the same destination, okay? <coughs> Fitness levels is another one that impacts um, players. So we said at the start, two key things for me are injury prevention, reduction, fitness, performance development. Now these are re real values. This is average data, again, um, kind of grabbing these from Ellie a little bit. So average scores, sorry, metric, because I'm from the UK, but five meter sprint, 30 meter sprint under 17s, five meter, 30 meter for our 20s. So obviously um, lower is better, lower is better. Average for jump, these weren't super kangaroos, it's a different system and different metrics. So that's one thing to be aware of if you ever read anything in the in the data or in the whatever, just check what methods are used and what units they're using, okay? Because um, that is uh, inches and centimeters. And then we use an endurance test called the YERT. Um, higher is better. What do you notice about those results? 17s are higher than the 20s in every single, single metric. 
Why might that be? Just throw out any reasons, any possible explanation. Closer to their peak. Closer to their peak? What else? Fatigue, potentially about 20s. When were they tested? Was it end of end of NCAA season? Um, how do you find it? I always get confused with that. Um, state, stage of the season tested. What else? What happens during that college season? Previous injuries. What happens during the college season, though? What's a typical college season consist of? How much training does the teams really do? 20 hours a week. Yeah, but if you got two games Friday, Sunday, how much training are you really doing? So yeah, I get it, but how much <coughs> conditioning are you doing? So actually, are you getting in season? Are you detraining? Also, how often do players, I feel like it's more now than it was three or four years ago, how often are players playing complete 90 minute games? I remember when Crystal Dunn first came into the national team, she wasn't, she might have been the extreme because of where she was, but she, would, she wasn't used to playing 90 minutes. Her, her scores on this test were super low, and that was something we really had to focus on because she wasn't used to playing 90 minutes. This is the average for the seniors. For me, a lot of things, strength, for sure, impacts these three in terms of the difference. And this is like phenomenal. I didn't even realize how, how big that was. Um, so again, for me, fitness levels of players at the youth ages is such an important part for injury prevention, but then also for performance. And again, it's not just about what they're doing on the field, it's what they're doing as soon as they leave the field. Because what they do as soon as they leave you determines how intense their next session or the next game is. So you guys have such a, a role in terms of monitoring what they do here, but then also what they do away from you. Last one I just wanted to show you, and again, this is some of Ellie's work, were just some of the match demands for the different age groups. So she got some of those GPS trackers on some development academy players, and then our 17s, 20s. So this is the average, uh, oh, she's missed a zero off here, otherwise that's super low. Uh, average total distance for a player in each of those. So on average, U17s covering about 8.2 kilometers, sorry again, we're metric. Um, which is about probably four, 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 four and a half miles. 17s, 9.8, so close to five miles. U20s, 10K, so just over five, um, uh, no, that would be six miles, sorry. Um, so that's distance is covered. You then look at work rate, meters per minute. So for sure our 20s are, are, high, are covering a higher work rate. We then look at that thing called the high speed runner that I was talking about yesterday where that's what we focus on because that's when we're more involved. And when we look at that, actually the U17 girls in development academy games are doing more of that high speed running than our 17s and 20s. Why might that be? Because actually our national team players, some of them do more high speed running with their end cell clubs than they do with the national team. Why might that be? Yeah, great. Kind of said a bit myself. With a national team, you're playing with the cream of every DA club, whereas with a DA club, potentially you are the cream of that club. So potentially you're doing more and having to win the ball back and so on. So potentially, so this is higher, but are those fitness levels higher to reflect that? Because that's what they're having to do. So again, that comes back to you guys in terms of what are you doing to prepare them. Just as a um, comparison, this is an average profile for our end of SL. So total distance, similar, 9.6 kilometers. So actually lower than the U20s, but comparable to the 17s. That high intensity distance, double what the youth players do. Her and again, national team, can do up to 1,500 meters of this. So again, it's down to the individual players. Players typically, Alin Williams is at 34 kilometers per hour, which is faster than probably 50% of male pro players. Um, so again, it comes down to being very individual as well as you go higher up that scale. What makes an elite player, which was actually the, the topic of this final talk, um, and this is the last little bit. For me, it comes back to all of this, is we can focus and a player can be good in one of these, but the elite players, and I class all of these in there, take care of all of it. Like, they work with mental coaches, 
They go as far here as their nutrition, as soon as making something to take with them so they can have it as soon as they finish training or a game. They do their prehab every single day. They do this, they do, you know, they, they sacrifice a lot. Like, again, I feel like at times they maybe don't get the credit for some of that. You know, Becky Sauerbrunn, her uh, partner is in Portland and she plays in Kansas. So she's away from him for seven months of the year. And when she does get a break from the club, she's in with the national team. And it's not where her boyfriend is. So, you know, people, they make a lot of sacrifices, like social um, relationship size, side, and they basically have, take care of all of these. That's what makes those elite players. And you miss one of these cogs, this slows down, and suddenly you're done. I had this opportunity in June this year, um, it was an equal playing initiative to uh, <laughs> hike Kilimanjaro um, and took part with this group of amazing females who played a soccer game at the peak, at the summit. So, um, good, geez, 15,000 feet, I think it was. Um, and there was one player who uh, was from Nepal and two days, so it took seven days to trek up there. We played the game, two days to get down. Uh, two, three days into the trip, she stopped eating the food, didn't like it, wasn't hydrating, wasn't sleeping. Basically, the day to actually get to the summit and play the game, we got a 3 a.m. wake-up call. It was then a six-hour trek up to the summit. You were literally in single file, and you were, like, head down, taking one step at a time, and you could, you looked up above you, and there was just lights, and you couldn't work out if it was the headlights of the other people climbing the other players, or if it was stars, because we were literally you were just head down and you were just going six hours. Um, she, she didn't make it because she hadn't been eating, she hadn't been hydrating. So she'd gone, she'd made all that preparation, all that effort, but because she'd suddenly dropped off nutrition, hydration, she didn't have enough in her to actually get to the climb and do the summit. So for me, it has such an impact on this. And just to finish with this slide is, this is what I say to the players all the time, and I commonly send them this quote, train like an athlete, eat like a nutritionist. If your nutritionist is gonna tell you not to eat that, why are you eating that? Or if your nutritionist wouldn't eat that, why are you doing it? Sleep like a baby, and ultimately, win like a champion. And that's, that's a simple philosophy.